Welcome to this week's Professional Conversations. My name is William Cuskin, and I am delighted by our guest today, Professor Juan Rodriguez, who I will be introducing in a few moments. Before we begin, I just want to say that this program is fundamentally about bringing industry leaders of experience and talent in electrical engineering to our educational community at CU Boulder. We have a tremendous leader today, one I'm really excited to introduce. Before I do, I want to say that this program comes out of the MSEE, which is the department's pathbreaking, pathbreaking online degree program that is focused on accessibility, communicating the knowledge of electrical engineering the world over. This program itself extends that by bringing professional development discussions to students everywhere on the globe. Without further ado, let me say first that we have archived these on the electrical engineering um, website, which I put in the chat, and I will put it in the chat once again. You're free to watch them there, and we've had good uptake there. We've had a wonderful talk by Robert White, who is here with us now, and a number of people have watched that, and I invite everyone viewing this to turn to that too. Let me now turn to our main event. Professor Juan Rodriguez is, in 1969, founded Storage Tech, which was an amazing, amazing, I think, adventure. I'm hoping he'll speak on that a little bit. In 1969, there's a heady and competitive disk technology market that the story of Storage Tech, I think, must be fascinating, and I would love to hear it. Professor Rodriguez went on in 1985 to found Exabyte Corporation in 1992, Sweetwater Filters in 1992, um, Data Sonic. He went on in 1998 to um, found E, I'm gonna mispronounce that, but Ecrix Corporation. And he is now Vice President of Strategy at Inside Photonics. Along the way, he has received many, many awards, including the 1995 Hispanic Engineer Entrepreneur of the, World, of, of the Year and the 2003 Townsend Harris Medal from the City College of New York. I'm a New Yorker myself, and I'm, I'm just so impressed by that. In 2012, he received a Doctor of Science from the University of Colorado, and he is now co-executive director of the wonderful Deming Center for Entrepreneurship. So with no further ado, I, I am just so honored and excited to hear Professor Rodriguez's talk tonight. And I turn it over to him. And with that, I'm going to stand aside. Oh, OK. <laughs> so um, let me see. I, here we are in the year 2020. Um, and when I was asked by Professor Kuskin to uh, make this call, I asked myself, what would the students like to hear today? And, and uh, I guess <laughs> my, my, I answered my question by saying, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask him that question. And, and I will, and if you would, uh, uh, text me on those issues uh, on, on the chat. I would uh, I would certainly uh, try to answer them. Uh, give me uh, 20 minutes to lay a base for for those questions. But uh, let me go ahead. So next question I ask myself: Well, if I don't know exactly what the students were uh, are asking today, I'll ask the, the next question: What was I thinking in 1963 when I was getting? Uh, my master's degree in electrical engineering. And I think my answer was simply, the only thing I can remember thinking about was, uh, would I get a job? And I guess, I guess that's probably part of your question today. Uh, and uh, I did get a job, by the way. I got a job with IBM, and uh, obviously that, that has been uh, totally influenced in my life. But, uh, 
when I look at back in 1963, I said, well, if I was in 1963 and someone from 57 years before uh, were to hold this conversation in 1906 over Zoom, uh, what, what, what would I be asking them? I really wouldn't know much about what was happening then. And I, and I thought about looking into that, uh, that period of 19, early 1900s, uh, what was going on in our profession, specifically electrical engineering. And uh, uh, my first thought, uh, I asked several, <laughs> what was happening in 1906? Well, at CU, the school was just uh, named School of Engineering. It had been started 10 years before as the School of uh, Applied Sciences. That's a very proper name, as, as we'll get to in a, a little bit, in a little bit. Uh, I, uh, I, in talking about engineering, you know, there's a, there's a building across the street from campus, the University Hill Elementary School, which was built in 1906. And if you were to go to, uh, to its uh, gym, uh, Great Hall, you would see the structure of the ceiling built along similar structural lines as the Queensboro Bridge in New York. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, all the metal work, uh, rivets and everything just reminded, I, I, I went in there, I had a couple of grandchildren going there and I look into the ceiling and I said, where, where have I seen this structure before? Queensboro Bridge. And I, I went and looked and it was in 2006. So just to say that in, in, in engineering, we rely quite a bit on, exper on experience and that experience is carefully written down and we tend to follow it carefully afterwards. Uh, experience is one of our main ingredients uh, of, of engineering. In, in fact, we're tasked to produce items for, for, for civilization. Uh, before, before electrical engineering, we had civil engineering. And what was civil engineering? Civil engineering was actually an extension of military engineering. Uh, military engineering was, as always, was funded much better than civil engineering. And, and the, two, the two went along side by side. I mean, even today, uh, we're divided into military engineering and civil engineering. Military engineering gets the most, a lot of the research money. Civil engineering gets very little research money. But civil learns from, from uh, military. The Romans, back, uh, back, back in their heyday, were some of the greatest civil engineers in the world. They, they built uh, great uh, aqueducts, spanning crevices over miles and, and delivering water to great cities. They built uh, bridges that still stand today. By the way, those, those aqueducts still stand today, many of them. And they, and they, had, they, break, uh, they built great roads. Out of Rome, uh, you had the, the Via Appia, which went south, and the Via Aurelia, which went north to France. Uh, and by the way, those roads that still exist, they've been paved over, but I, I, I bet those foundations laid by the Romans are still underneath that, keeping those uh, roads from caving in. And, and the, the Romans were, again, uh, great engineers. They followed, they, followed in, they, they followed their experience. They wrote it down. And with each new bridge, they, they improved it. They improved it. Before that, we can think of the pyramids as being uh, probably one of the greatest structures that have lasted the eons of time. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, what technologies they use, but I'm sure, I'm not sure, I, I don't think Euclid or Pythagoras was around then, or maybe it was, maybe they were. They, they were certainly around by Pythagoras, and I mean by, by the Romans, and I'm sure that Romans use Pythagoras. I mean, A squared plus B squared equals C squared is just kind of like the basis for a lot of, a lot of construction. But to get back, to get back to 1906, what's, what happened between 1906 and the time I graduated, 57 years later, a vacuum tube was, uh, was uh, invented in 1904. Uh, and 
And I say that because, I mean, for the next, for the next 50 years, it was the basis of all communication. Uh, in, in 1948, we, the transistor gets invented, and boy, what a revolution that came. Uh, and, and since then, of course, the transistor has evolved into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller structures leading to higher and higher density, higher and higher speeds, and lower and lower cost. If I can indicate one tube, the basis for one of the Boolean uh, algebraic uh, forms uh, that will do the or or the and and the power of the, and that's that's the equivalent of one byte. And we were to extend that by Moore's law, which calls for an, an order of magnitude improvement every five years, we would have at least 12 orders of magnitude improvement, which is an exa, which is 10 to the 12th, which is a million, million times. So that if you can equate one byte in 1960 to 10 to the 12 more, that would be one terabyte today in 2020. And and that terabyte probably, I, I'm not sure what a, what a tube was back in those days. It was more than a few bucks. But, uh, but anyway, that is, that, is, that is what I've grown up with. I, I, I went into IBM, I, I went into data storage. Uh, my master's degree, I, I, I uh, was one year of uh, transistor circuit design and one year of uh, control systems design, plus a few other things. Uh, and those two, I think, were the basis of my, my career. But in fact, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm a great believer in, in, in education, and, and, uh, and I believe the more, the more we know, the better our jobs are as engineers. But the laser was built in 1960. DNA uh, invented or, or published in the 1950s, but actually I saw, I saw an article that is actually discovered by a maestro in 1869, discover the amino acids and I guess DNAs, I don't understand DNA. <laughs> In, 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 in detail, I understand as being the great helix that runs our lives, but uh, uh, it wasn't really until probably the 1990s where the power of, of computing got to be large enough that people started to play with the DNA. And of course, today, when we think as, as about six, six, uh, 30 years later, uh, six orders of magnitude improvement in computing, which is a million times. Now they're now they're starting to use this this knowledge and this compute capability for designing these drugs or these vaccines that we also pray for will arrive sooner rather than later. I won't go out of my out of my house and they come out. Um, so. I've seen all this grow, and if I were to be asked what's going to be happening, uh, where are we going to be 57 years from now? Uh, my first answer, I'm not, probably not, I know where I'm going to be, <laughs> uh, but where you are going to be 57 years from now, I'm not sure, but I can guarantee you that there's very little that was going to be there in, 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 in what would be 2077. That we don't know something about today. There's not being worked on today. Maybe at some very basic science level. Maybe at some more, a little closer to reality level. Maybe in some engineering lab, somebody trying to make it work. Some clever guy's going to come up with it three or four years from now or 10 years from now. And, 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 and his, his invention is not going to be totally, totally an artifact taken, taken out, of, out of vacuum 
it'll be based on what he's learned. So uh, again, if I were to uh, advise an, a, a, a master's engineer, uh, but what would I say? I would say, well, first of all, follow, follow what you love. Uh, you, you, you're taking courses today in, 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 in things that you might like. Uh, do well in those things, and the better you do in them, the more you're going to like them, and so on. The, the virtuous circle of, of doing, of doing good, doing well, doing better, and, and, and liking and loving what you do. That's, I think, that's the essence. Uh, if I were to tell you, you you're going to go into uh, industry, uh, most likely. Uh, Knowing, uh, knowing about industry uh, and how industry works is probably a great basis uh, of your engineering knowledge. There's very little you, you can do in engineering outside of industry. Uh, you can talk about the university, uh, but in fact, university is funded a lot by industry. So it's nice to know how industry works. Uh, and I would say, again, expanding your basis of education is, is something you can do you're doing now by studying getting your master's you can select a few more courses by maybe going to the engineering management curriculum and, and studying all those courses that are being offered right now uh, and, and my advice in, in, in reading uh, the the synopsis of what those courses offered if you if, if in reading it you 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 uh, see a word you don't understand, take that course. Mm. Uh, it would be like me asking you if, uh, if uh, go over to the math department and if you if you read through a course and you and you can't quite figure out figure out what multiplication means, please take that course because I think you'll need it. Uh, and I can say the same thing about that thing that you don't know about business. Uh, or industry, and could it be project management, budgeting, a jillion things. Uh, take that course. It will, that knowledge will never go to waste. Uh, whether you're at the university running, trying to build a budget, or, or in industry trying to do that, running a group of PhD students uh, from, a, from a professional uh, project management standpoint or, or, or whatever, uh, there, isn't, there isn't a knowledge that, that I look back at my experience, both from education and, and experience standpoint, and I can't, I, I can't believe there was a course that I didn't, uh, that I haven't applied to throughout my life. I mean, a, a bit of experience relating things from one to the other. So uh, I think another question, I'll, I'll go from that. What, 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 is, what is the value of education and experience? I, I, uh, I wrestled with that over many years because we hired, we hired PhDs at lower salaries than we had for, for very experienced technicians. Hmm. We had very experienced technicians leading great, great, great masses. Of, 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 of people. So when I, when I, when I, when I was trying to say, how do I, how do I deal with this issue? And I came up with a very simple uh, Euclidean form of analysis. I looked at a rectangle and, and if you can look at the, the, the width, if you can lay it down vertically and look at the width of the rectangle as, as the, as the amount of education you have and, and, and the depth of the, vert of, the, of the other side of the rectangle. Uh, so you look at breadth, education, depth as experience. And I look at the area of that rectangle, that's your value from, an, from a project standpoint, from an industry standpoint. Uh, if I look at a project, I like to depend to have someone with a very, very deep experience level. Someone that during the project will keep us from reinventing the wheel. 
someone who will tell us it's been done before and this is the way it was done. And you need to do it, do it the same way. If you need to improve it, improve it. But, but, and, then, and then you need that, that broad educational background to tackle the problem, the new problems that come up. And I mean the new, the ones that the experience hasn't experienced before. So when I, when I think of a project, and I led, I've led directly somewhere close to 100 different projects in my life. Uh, a nice mixture of, of experienced in ex and, and uh, experienced with low, low, very, very narrow experience to, to uh, little experience, but very broad background and a mixture of those uh, as the best mix of people you could have in a project. Hmm. Uh, men, women, uh, I, I uh, during my during my during my experience, unfortunately, we have, I haven't had that many women uh, in in my groups. I've had a few, and they've all been amazing engineers. Uh, we did come. We do come from a from a period where where uh, somehow or other women were deflected away from engineering. I can tell you that my, my, my incoming class uh, to City College in 1957, 3,000 students, 2,000 male, 1,000 females. And in our uh, freshman assembly, being told, look around you, two out of three won't be here when you graduate. Uh, we graduated 1,000 males and four females. So that worked, the two out of three did work. Yeah. So, uh, and, and of course, the, the, the four women were amazing people back then. Uh, but that has been the story. Uh, it has improved tremendously. Not, 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 not good enough. Uh, but uh, I, I, again, I, I, I'm involved now with the group. Some amazing women, uh, engineers. I'm talking about and. Uh, uh, things have come a long way, not long enough. Uh, uh, let's see, where was I? <laughs> the, I think I get distracted by that it's statistic. Oh. Um, that, the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Super powerful point. I want us to come back to it. But you were talking about the relationship between breadth and depth in project management. And you were connecting that to education versus technical experience. Um, right. And I was enjoying that. I, 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 I want to push you further into that because right. it seems to me a, a, an important point in thinking about how to balance, how to both manage knowledge within a team, but also how to think about the value of, of hindsight and reflecting back on those Roman ruins and what's been done before, but then also thinking about disruption and how to change the existing patterns of knowledge. Very difficult, very difficult. Uh, I, I have an example. Uh, again, I've been in, in, story, in, in data stories all my life, all my professional life. I was heading, I was the general manager of the hard disk product division of Storage Tech in 1980. Uh, and there was a group of guys that came here. We were at the time designing the, the highest capacity hard disk drive in the world. It was one gigabyte, okay? Gigabyte, not that right, gigabyte. And we sold that product for $50,000 a piece. Uh, and this group of guys came to us, those guys, unfortunately, but it was guys who, who were proposing a five megabyte unit for a thousand bucks. So if you look at price performance, they were well below, they were well below, I mean, they were much more expensive than us, okay? Uh, but yet the price point of a thousand dollars 
went along with, this is 1979, they went along with actually what would, be, what would become the personal computer. Right, yeah. right. But it was only five megabytes. Right. We could not conceive anything that would take so little storage, right? And those guys were, uh, were found at Seagate, okay, which is one of the three surviving disk companies. This issue, this issue is just pervasive across industry. It's very easy to dismiss something that's disruptive. And I was part of the disruptive side. I mean, I had the title of uh, vice president of technology at the time also. <laughs> I discarded that, right? You see, it, it kind of wasn't technology, but it was, you know, it's very hard to design a product at a much lower price point and, and make it work. I've always felt new technology should be introduced at the highest price point, at a price point where you can afford to screw up things and, and, not, and not screw the business, okay? So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, in, in, the 19, in the 1980s, I talk about, I talk about, the, the 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 probably the three uh, most most significant uh, tools that have come into engineering since I went to school in 1963. Our our basic calculator was this. Wow, this is a slide rule. If you haven't seen one, and there the slide slides along. And if you could get. Uh, three significant digits of precision. You you were pretty good. Sometimes we, we brag we could get four. But but when it when it came to making calculations that require more than that, it required an army of, of mathematicians with 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 log tables and, and, and trigonometric tables, you know, that went out to six or eight or ten. And if you had a point in between you 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 averaged those two points. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and yet, in, in 1974, all of a sudden, TI came up with this. You know, look at this. Yeah. You know, this is a calculator, right? It, it was, that, uh, th that keyboard has been duplicated a jillion times since then. This is, this is, uh, this is the most amazing tool we've ever had. And one that we still carry with us. Uh, in, in the 1980s, and, and when I talk about disruptive technology, the workstation came around. IBM discarded the workstation. They, they didn't even look at it. By the way, they, they, they forgot about the PC too. They said, ah, it'll never work. The same price point issue. Hey, you know, we, we always look for bigger and better product, not, not things that are a lot less. Uh, but that workstation, in 1990, I saw a demonstration where, uh, in a workstation, you were, uh, you were demonstrating the, the, uh, the dynamic characteristics of a fairly complex mechanical structure. And uh, by, by visualizing, by showing us how the structure moved along as we excited it in, at different frequency points and, and saw the resonances in the structures, we were able to play with the structure dynamically and, and, and lessen or move those, those resonance points or, or, or to a position where, where maybe they weren't relevant or, or we could control, okay? But you, you couldn't do that by, by looking at, you know, at, at a dozen different differential equations looking for a simultaneous solution. Uh, while, while, you know, this, 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 this PlayStation, I mean, it was an engineering PlayStation, <laughs> you, you could see this thing move and, 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 you could, and you could see how things that you were doing to change the structure. And so that was, that was probably the next invention. And, and the last thing which I've been talking about is compute power. You know, again, in the 1980s linguistics, right? And being people trying to understand speech, uh, a lot of algorithms were coming around, but pretty soon people, people knew that you needed also compute power. And the compute power not only to do more of the same, but be able to get more complex algorithms to do more and more efficiently. But you need more compute power. So, and, and that compute power basically working with DNA today. So, you know, to, to our biology ex expert here, 
I would say, boy, the combination of the two sciences, ah, it's just something else. I mean, it's got, it's got to be a, there's got to be a great future in, in that, in that, in that joining of the two, which have been going on for a while, but it's got a long ways to go. I mean, if I, if I, if, if I can uh, critique our, our biology or medical uh, uh, professionals, uh, is their diagnostic capabilities compared to what we do in electrical engineering are just nothing. Okay. Oh. I mean, you know, they touch your belly and they tell you you have the, the, that uh, appendicitis, right? But, but, but they can't, you know. And maybe, you know, and then they put a thermometer in your mouth and say, yeah, you have a temperature. And uh, so, you know, uh, there's a great future in, in somehow or other marrying the two. Um, if I were to, again, advise our, our biology um, uh, student uh, where to go. If you go into a corporation, please go into what would be their mainstream product. If you can avoid being in a support group, avoid it, okay? Just get in the middle of what they do because that's, that's the one thing that they will always do. And, and if you wanna be a hero, uh, and you want to be a goat, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, you don't want to be a goat, but you will make mistakes. Mistakes are difficult to correct unless you can be a hero. Uh, the running back that drops the ball on the one yard line and then, and then takes it, that takes uh, in the next two or three plays, takes the thing inside. What, what, what takes the, the, the ball in, into, the, into, into the touchdown? What people remember, he dropped the ball or that he scored the touchdown, you know. So uh, you can make up for a lot of mistakes if you're a hero. It's, it's hard to make up mistakes when, when you're in a support group and everybody's yelling at you because you're not doing the job that, that they want you to do. Uh, mainstream. New projects are, are, are very exciting in, 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 in corporations, but unfortunately, unless they're, they're really a continuation of mainstream products, they're bound to be dropped when, when, when things go bad, when the economy goes bad. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what else to say. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated and I'm following you and just, I'm enjoying your talk so much. In 1963, when you were in IBM, you were thinking about storage tech, did you have the same feeling about mainstream products? Or did you want to get out into new product design? I was, I was a poor, dumb junior engineer who, who had a job. And that was the thing I was most grateful for. I was at Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, an hour's drive, an hour and a half drive from New York City, right? Where, where my family, and family lived, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I wasn't thinking so deep. Uh, if, if I blame anything from my City College NYU education is that I didn't take any business courses, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, by the way, at, at City College, we had 145 credits to graduate, not a single elected, okay? Wow. Yeah, that was, that, uh, in uh, NYU, we, but they were all, I, don't, I guess they were all electives. Uh, uh, but, you know, who would think about taking a management course? I mean, that was an engineering, right? So, uh, no, no, I, I really didn't have any perspective or respective of, of what, uh, of, of, of the world, uh, except I had a job. <laughs> so, but as an entrepreneur, did you end up throwing over uh, company jobs and starting new things? How did you get over that fear? Uh, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I think a lot of young people now are gripped by fear of uncertainty and of inconsistent employment. And how do you, how do you, did you think about that in your own life? Well, yeah, well, yeah, there were two or three times I'll tell you about them. Uh, I think one time was, uh, when I, when I left IBM in 1969, 
Uh, four of us quit that day to start the company. And uh, uh, it, it was, I was 28 years old, you know, I, I'm not sure I, 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 I put a lot of uh, fear into my, I was very, very, very confident in myself. I, I, I was doing things that I was doing things very well in technically. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, actually what I felt was, I, there was a level of sadness about leaving IBM because, because, but, but, but a measure of freedom, because I mean, that, that was the sad part. I, I thought I was leaving jail. I mean, I had this feeling, you know, that I was being, uh, I was able to go free, 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 free. So it's a level of freedom. Remember, you know, IBM at that time was, was, was a job for life. And, and, uh, uh, and, you know, you, as IBM stood for, I'm being moved, you know, in, in, uh, that was my first move to Boulder in 1966. I mean, that was my first move in IBM when, when we came to Boulder. And I was expecting that to be one of several, probably four or five. Huh. Probably end up in White Plains, New York at headquarters if I was going great. Okay. Uh, so no, no, that was, that was different. Uh, back in, in so, uh, I mean, different experiences. In 1985, uh, Source Tech had just gone bankrupt. And uh, I had I was heading a group of 490 people doing optical disc. We we're very close to getting a product. The company went bankrupt, Chapter 11, and uh, and I didn't like the new guy that came in. <laughs> Long story. Uh, and uh, and I left, and, and so so there was no fear there. I mean, uh, when the fear came afterwards, said, you know, where, where do I get a job? I mean, I'm a I'm a uh, large corporation. We, we had 16,000 employees at that moment. Uh, and, uh, and I was, a high, I was in the, <laughs> I sat next to, next to God in that company, right? So uh, I, I, I looked around Boulder and there wasn't really a hell of a lot that I could do in town. So I started a company, okay? Um, that was uh, Exavite, you know, and that grew and we went public four years later, five years later. We did very well there. Uh, you know, we couldn't get to 16,000 people, but the, the world had changed. Uh, in 1969, you did everything you needed to do within, from within the company. By 1985, we were, we were outsourcing lots of stuff, okay? Uh, hmm. including, including manufacturing and stuff. Uh, in, in 1970, we had to buy a mid-frame, uh, mid-large frame, a large mid-frame computer. Uh, in, uh, and that, they cost a million bucks then, more than that, right? 1985, I could buy a PC that could do most of the job for a few thousand bucks, right? And could run the company, I could run payroll. I mean, I could run a lot of things there. The spreadsheet had to be less than 300K bytes because uh, that was the size of a floppy disk. And that's, that's what you had there, you know? So three years later, we went to six, 600 kilobytes and we could do a 600 kilobyte spreadsheet, right? So, uh, uh, so things were, we were, we were less, we, we outsourced our manufacturing. At the, we got into a deal with the Japanese company to build some of our product. We, we built half of it here in Boulder. Wow. Uh, but but uh, but I, at the same time we were getting a lot of circuit board built by other companies, things that we had lawyers that we that we you know uh, professionals that we that we went to for for a lot of those out, outdoor services. Uh, so uh, it was a much smaller company in that sense, uh, but it, it it employed a lot of people worldwide. Um, in uh, it's, it's interesting how the company structure changed by yeah. the time uh, I started another company, Accre, in 1996. Uh, it was mostly about outsourcing. It was, uh, and of course, today we see the danger of outsourcing, you know, uh, uh, stability of economies, political stability, and all that stuff is obviously an issue. Uh, but w one thing that's changed since then, we all we were always of the of the discipline that we would multiply source. 
and and that included and that including um, geography uh, and uh, I'm not sure we thought political but we were, we, the United States was too powerful to worry about political forces so then um, but it was uh, yeah it was, it was obviously each, each one of those companies grew up in a different different point I mean we we obviously were hiring women <laughs> quite a bit back in those days. In, in the exabyte, from 1985 on, women really started coming in. Hmm. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure why, uh, but anyway. <laughs> so, so I, I, I have some. I have a question, but I wanted to um, both Caitlin and Victory here. Do you do you have questions and of course, Mr. White, do you have questions? This is an opportunity here to ask Professor Rodriguez whatever you think about um, disruption, entrepreneurship, the long view of American companies uh, developing. I, I wonder if you have any questions. And if you don't, take a moment and think about it. Uh, yes, I do. I actually uh, raised my hand uh, some time ago. Great. Okay, uh, the, the question is addressed uh, to Professor uh, Yonder Gere. So, uh, when I look at your background and uh, the, the things you've done throughout the years, um, uh, I, 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 I noticed that, uh, you know, you, 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 co -found, you founded companies, you co-founded companies, and, uh, you know, from time to time, you move from one company to, you know, either you, you, you move from one company to the other. So, what, what was the motivation, you know? Um, what prompted you? What motivated you? Did you identify uh, a problem within the within the society that you wanted to create a solution for it, or is this something that you say, you know what, um, I'm going to create a product and look for marketing guys to to sell the product for me, or or did some sort of a marketing uh, institution tell you, you know what, uh, design this product and we'll sell it for you, or what what actually inspired you, you know, to to uh, not to start to create, to start a company to solve a problem or to create a product and then afterward you start another one or you co-found another one uh, in that manner. So I just want to you know to for, for, for the first company for the first company at Story Stack I think for, I was looking for the opportunity of being number one. Okay, uh, uh, I had experience in, in my area of expertise, which was basically recording and, and playback detection. Um, I was, I was, I was, I was number one in that company. Uh, as a result of which, I, I had, you know, I had all the technology elements uh, in, in that company. So, I mean, I would say that that was my my driving force back then. In in uh, in 1985, my driving force of starting another company was that well, the old company had gone bankrupt, and a new guy had come in, what they called the um, the guy, a turnaround guy. And I didn't like them. Okay, so so I quit. And then I said, "Oh, gee, I need a job." So <laughs> I started. A I, I did some consulting for several months, and I knew that I didn't like I didn't like the travel that that involved. Okay, it was fine from an income standpoint, but it wasn't. And then the the other problem with consulting, when you've been the boss, is that you t you t you tell people what you, you think they ought to do. And they do whatever they want, you know. It's, it's, not, it's not so. So so I got a job. I got a job. I started another company. I, I was able to get investors that had invested in the storage technology company. Um, and uh, I actually uh, another company that I helped start in 1980 was High Omega. I, I helped the guys get some money, and I was on the board of that company for quite a few years. Uh, and uh, so, so that was the thing. In, in 1990, I, I, I left, well, I, I stepped down from the CEO position, remained chairman for a couple of years. I was tired, I was very tired. Uh, I had been running uh, the optical disc program at, 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 at Storage uh, very hard, especially the last year, year and a half. And then Exabyte was very hard, both mentally and physically, but mentally, emotionally. I mean, a lot of things happening, a lot of good things. There's always a lot of bad things, you know. 
that this, the, 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 the history of success is not necessarily the history that people read, which is about how successful you were, but while you were doing it, all, all the times that you had to go through that narrow spot, which, which meant if you went one way, you failed, and you went the other way, you, 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 you went through this narrow spot, right? And, those, and there's quite a few of those narrow spots. And if you're on top, you're worried about everything because there's always something going wrong. The moment somebody fixes a problem, somebody else has got another problem. So, so if you have half a dozen problems, the moment the first one is solved, you're looking at the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one, right? So they never stop. So it's very tired, very tired. And then uh, that's when the university asked me to come in and do a couple of things in 1992. And, uh, and, but unfortunately, I had the bug in me and, and uh, I started a couple of other companies during that time frame. And uh, I really enjoyed the teaching. I touched the, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneurship course, uh, which was both in the engineering and the business school. It was a joint class. Uh, I think you may still have that. It's probably still in the books. Uh, and, and, and so I enjoyed that very much, but I got sucked back into industry because it was something I missed. Okay, and uh, so I mean, after that point, I I I, I, uh, I did a few things. Uh, I'm not sure anything was as exciting or, or as successful as as uh, those first few things, but they were all fairly successful. Uh, and I'm I'm involved right now with a company that's working on lidar, which is you know this the eyes and ears of, uh, of cars uh, of the future. And I think we got a pretty good technology there. Uh, I think we have the best technology. And, and I'm just consulting. I'm not really doing any hard work there, just, just looking at strategy more, more than anything else. Uh, so so uh, when you talk about fear, uh, no, I, I don't think you can be driven by fear. I mean, you have to obviously have to Plan for some of the downside if you can, but if you have if you have the confidence in yourself, you know, especially at your age, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's the one of the wonderful things about America. <laughs> the opportunities are really very broad, very broad. I mean, deep too, but broad, right? And um, uh, I mean, one of the I, I, I can tell you one, one of the problems we had. Uh, one of the problems that they have in Silicon Valley is that a guy, if he gets upset, a person, a woman, a man, who gets upset, can go across the street and get a job. Okay, we, we, here, in, here in Boulder, we didn't have that problem until probably the, the, the mid 90s, okay? I, I mean, prob the problem, problem from a company standpoint, okay? Well, you can't afford to get anybody pissed off at you because you're going to quit and go across the street. Okay. Uh, now, we're, now the companies have that problem. There is a lot of opportunities here in town, right? So uh, it benefits the, 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 the worker uh, and uh, uh, as opposed to being stuck in, in, in Boulder in 1970, uh, where we were the only, well, we and IBM, but we just quit IBM, so we should go back to work there, you know? <laughs> So, uh, no, no, I think, yeah, I think if you're going to do this, you got to have, you know, you got to have the, um, the confidence that you're going to get through it. You also need the money. That's why I suggest that maybe you learn a little bit more, a little bit about corporations, starting something, starting a business, um, and what it takes. Uh, but I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't think I ever felt fear <laughs> until I was in the company. <laughs> in the narrow space. Can you yeah. another question? Um, yeah, I, I did want to ask, you know, as you're, as you're working with new graduates, is there any sort of theme or common pitfalls you see people just reproducing um, like advice you would give to the new graduate who's starting their career? Well, uh, 
again, I, I think uh, I think one one of the greatest luxuries in my life has been liking what I've done. And in doing that, it isn't just all fun, you know, there's a lot of pain involved in that. Uh, but but after you succeed, you, you get you 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 feel good looking back, right? Uh, so uh, I mean, I was certainly I mean, it's certainly advice to follow your 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 love, your heart in, 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 into your into into your career. You can't you can't take a job nine to five and and, and think that. And I think you're going to be very successful. Okay, I mean, it's got to be it's got to be you immersed you're part of it you is part of you and uh and, and and the hours that you're working on it are, are not an, it's not it's not a measure of how old you're doing uh, it's it's getting the job done than what you're doing uh, you hope you work for a place that doesn't drive you you know drive you uh 24 7 uh but you ought to be uh, ought to be willing to work 24 7 during certain points in the cycle of a project or or somewhere where all of a sudden things just pile up and you got to get through it right so you're going you go from relatively easy workings because you're a professional you don't get paid by the by the hour uh you get honored for what you do uh but but when the moment comes you know it's between you you and the rocks uh, you know between the rock and the hard spot right it's you got to do it and you got to do it and you got to love it otherwise yeah i don't think you can do some some of that hard stuff i'm not sure how to answer your question but, uh, oh well i thought that was a beautiful statement i'm i'm truly moved uh, caitlin you you asked the question so you should have the final follow-up here yeah i mean i think that's a great answer I, I took it as a beautiful answer because it, it's where you began, um, Juan. You began with follow what you love and you've brought us back now to follow your heart. And through that, I've seen some really powerful, powerful through lines. Um, your sense of education, looking for challenge, looking for expanding into business opportunities. And I see in, in just about everything you've said, a desire for freedom and a belief in a confident belief that if you desire your own direction your own freedom and you follow with what you love and you move forward honestly you'll be all right and i think that that is just an amazing truth to lay against the moment that we're in a moment of fear a moment of uncertainty a moment where people are really confused about what lies ahead. I think the statement you're giving us is a powerful one of conviction, conviction in belief. Yeah, as, and as far as electrical engineers, you know, I, I chose electrical engineer because I heard someone who, who I, I, I appreciated um, that electronics was the way of the future. <laughs> and I still say that, by the way, I mean, uh, the world is the world of electrical engineering has gotten much, much broader than it was then. Uh, and I, I, I don't think, no matter what profession, what what discipline you follow, you, I mean, you can become a lawyer, you can, you, you can become an accountant, you can be president of the company, you can become president of the United States. I, I think the the, the knowledge, the, the the deep knowledge that the, the, the electrical engineering brings to us. I mean, this issue of power these days uh, that is, you know, uh, so basic, uh, I, I mean electrical power, not political power. <laughs> That's an issue too. Uh, is, uh, is, you know, it, I think it leads us to understand so many things that must be voodoo to a lot of people, you know, because it does, electricity does work like voodoo in so many ways, you know. And the fact that I'm looking at you and uh, talking to so many people across spaces of ether, 
it's uh, just amazing. But you know, not, but but not surprising to to most of us who live through it. But I mean, it's, we understand. I I wouldn't know how to do some of this stuff. I mean, or I wouldn't know how to do most of this stuff that's being done today. But if I worked on it a little bit, I probably could. <laughs> No, I found that a okay. wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, I have another question for Professor Rodriguez. Um, you know, uh, throughout you've uh, actually emphasized, uh, you know, the, the the importance and the relevance of, uh, you know, of uh, acquiring, uh, let's say, a, a, a education and um, or applied knowledge. Uh, let me put it that way. Um, in, in addition to, you know, in addition to, you know, to to um, that is to to consist consistently or consistently improve yourself um, in, in the education sense, uh, and maybe to become an uh, what uh, what else what else can throughout your professional uh, uh, career and life what else can someone do you know in addition to acquiring actionable uh, knowledge and uh, expanding your horizon uh, what else can you do to stand out uh, unique let's say within, uh, within your profession or within an industry or within your tribe. What else have you seen uh, uh, along the years that, uh, that tend to uh, differentiate you know, uh, someone from, from the rest, you know, in terms of uh, education, in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, I don't know, maybe the uh, uh, ethics, work ethics or... So just to, if there's something that you really need to bring to our attention to, to look at it, to zoom into it and also to See if something we could uh, uh, absorb as a part of our, uh, you know, uh, part of our life as we expand our careers, as we uh, venture into, into into new territories. Uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you. You know, uh, I mean, I, I I could be silly in expanding this rectangular uh, approach to education and experience to 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 a cube and add another dimension to that. Uh, and the other dimension is is, is 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 bringing in another discipline into into your in, into your picture, and just adding to the to, to, you know the in 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 electronics we've been able to 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 increase the density of uh, of, of transistors uh, in, in, in 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 two dimensions right in the plane in the surface right. I mean, the devices obviously uh, have some depth, but if if we could bring a third dimension into building these things, boy, the things that we could do, right? And and the, and the same thing with this knowledge experience base. I think, uh, I mean, you can start thinking about knowledge and experience going into another dimension, right? And and when you bring, but when you bring those three dimensions together, is 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 when you pr probably have something. When I look at some of the uh, founders of, uh, of some of these companies like uh, Seagate or Microsoft or, or uh, Apple, right? You know, they, these were not ordinary people, right? Uh, they, they, came from, they came from relatively sophisticated backgrounds. Uh, some people don't talk about them. You know, this guy didn't finish college, this and that. But some people were bringing in experience for some, several different dimensions. You come from a different country. Uh, you bring a level of experience and knowledge which which is, is not found in the United States, okay? Now you say it's not important. All it is, it is. You know, it, always, you know, it, it just gives you a slightly different view of, a, of the same subject. And sometimes in that different view, you see, you, you, you see an opportunity, okay? So, uh, you know, a, a lot of the uh, leaders in the United States that were born in the United States also come from, from the central part of the United States. If you look at uh, a lot of very, you, you wonder why somebody from the middle of Nebraska can, can I, I I, I can't mention names. I mean, I, I don't remember names, but uh, somebody from the middle of, from the middle of nowhere can come in and lead a, the, the, one of the greatest companies in the United States. I'm not sure which one that is. Okay, I'm just telling you that those those 
those people, those successes come from having a different vantage, from bringing a woman into, into, in, into the pictures. The, oh boy, the, the, the points of view that they bring is the same education, same, but, but obviously their experience is different, right? So inclusivity is, 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 is important. Bring different, band, a different any, any depth to that, to, to that rectangle that I just talked about. It's a level of, of advantage over everybody else that, is, that is, is, uh, is, is, is hard to measure, but this is what these great leaders or inventors or any innovators bring that, 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 that other sense added to everybody else's. Because, you know, uh, geez, you know, everybody was building PCs at the end of the 70s, okay? Uh, and, and I do mean that, okay? Um, I mean, somebody heard that there was such a thing as a PC. I mean, they, they weren't calling it that, but it was a mini computer or a small or a microcomputer. Uh, and, 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 uh, and only, you know, a couple, two or three companies. I mean, they're pretty big companies right now, Microsoft. No. And, uh, Apple, this, you know, so, yeah. this brings us back beautifully to um, Mr. Robert White's lecture from two weeks ago, where he talked very, very distinctly about inclusivity and about the power of multiple perspectives and of understanding that, that different, different people bring different things to a problem that open it up. Um, really, the overlap between the two talks is just striking me the power of education and continuous learning and continually challenging yourself to get out of just one narrow discipline and to expand your thinking. So um, I think this is great. I also think that Victory, Caitlin, I push you back, Adam, I push you back to our, our other talk because I think that they overlap beautifully and, and texture each other wonderfully. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I can talk for hours, <laughs> but, I, but I think it's late enough. <laughs> so let me thank everyone. Let me thank, first thing, um, let me thank everybody for sticking with us, for being part of this. What I found was a tremendously moving talk about ultimately self-direction. And let me thank you, um, Juan. I'm, I began by apologizing that we didn't have a greater turnout, but in the end, I felt that we had a kind of intimacy here that was truly unique and special. And I want to thank you for giving us that. It, I see it as a gift. Um, I also want to thank Robert White, Bob White, for coming back and joining us again, bringing a kind of continuity. So I'm uplifted as we head into the unknown. Um, I'm uplifted by us all coming together and talking about what it is to be educated. So thank you all. Thank you. I wish you safe passage. Yeah, you too. Yeah, yeah, let's live through this uh, pandemic. Let's live through it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, onwards. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor. <laughs>